All right, we're going to give it a couple of seconds to reach the LinkedIn universe, um, all the podcast platforms, YouTube, Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. And we are live. Welcome, everyone. This is episode three of season two of the Level Up Your Wealth podcast. We talk about the gaming industry uh, from a financial perspective. I'm one of your hosts, Marcus Howard. And uh, this podcast is proudly sponsored by the gamers at Stoned Ape. They build and create um, healthy vegan supplements to help you optimize your mood, your energy, and your sleep. Um, and so we'll, we'll, we're excited to speak to Amir. Before we do that, Mario, can you introduce yourself to everyone? What's going on, y'all? Hope all is well. Mario Payne in beautiful Jacksonville, Florida. The stock market wasn't beautiful today, but what is beautiful is people getting jobs in a slow down economy like today. So we have Amir. So Amir, introduce yourself and let us know all the wonderful things you are doing. Thank you so much. You're my type, of, my type of people, I tell you that. So hi, everybody, some of whom I already know, Amir Satfat. I'm a director of business development at Tencent Games. A lot of you may know me from my other hat that I wear as well on LinkedIn, where I'm a top voice in video games on the platform. And I enjoy talking about a whole bunch of things around games, positivity, career topics, and uh, we'll have a lot of fun today. Excellent, excellent. So thank you, everyone, for joining us live. Um, and anyone who's listening after this gets to the podcast platforms, if you are joining us live, feel free to send us questions in the chat uh, for Mario or Amir. Happy to get those answered. Amir, it, it was funny when I first connected with you on LinkedIn, you know, I was happy to do some networking. I'm always trying to network, actively network on LinkedIn. And I remember that your response to me was, you know, thanks for connecting, uh, but I don't have time for a 10 minute chat. And I, I wasn't insulted, but I was a little surprised by that response. And then over the, the last year and a half have been connected. Now I can appreciate that response because of the, the amount of work that you do. Uh, can you talk about your journey into the gaming industry and then your schedule? Yeah, absolutely. Well, boy, the journey into the games industry, it's kind of simple, but I guess also not. So as we were joking about a little bit in our pre-live, as many of you know, I'm from Connecticut. And while I moved around, I've been on the East Coast of the United States my whole life. And so other than a few notable exceptions like, you know, Bethesda and other places, but certainly not when I was coming out of high school and college, there were no games companies really on the East Coast. And so there were opportunities I could have taken after graduating from college, but it would have meant moving to California, Seattle, et cetera. And for a variety of reasons, that just wasn't something I wanted to do because of my family. So as I'm sure is true for many others for many reasons... I knew that I couldn't act on what I wanted to do immediately, but I needed to keep my feet moving. So whether it was school, gaining work experience, staying passionate about the space, playing games, I just kept doing that until finally things got to a point where that was possible, which turned out not to be basically until post-COVID when people kind of re-examined some of their attitudes around remote work. So I didn't get into the industry until, you know, 35, 36, but it was worth the wait you know, spent three years, et cetera, at Amazon Games in a few capacities, BD strategy production, and now the role at Tencent Games. So that kind of was my journey into the industry. On the other side, as you asked about scheduling, uh, as again, many kind of regular readers of my channel may know, I post about kind of how to balance these things with, you know, three kids, with doing all the work stuff and other posts and content, having a full-time job. And like, I, I am very, uh, I guess maybe like mild OCD, hyper overscheduled for myself. So I have like an Excel based schedule that I think I once posted on where like literally like half hour to half hour, I make a plan on a month to month basis of what I'm going to do for family time, what I'm going to do for dinner, what I'm going to do for work when I post, when I play games. And I even like have a sub schedule on top of that of like what games I play and, well, uh, and when. And so obviously that flexes because life is unpredictable. But I find being that overscheduled for me is what helps me kind of fit all that stuff in at once. So you manage your time like you manage your money, which is Mario's domain, right? <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. One, one day at a time instead of one investor at a time. Yeah. There we go. And we have some comments coming in. So, uh, so Wilbert, he's in Rhode Island, uh, 45 minutes away from Connecticut. Now, was that with traffic or without traffic? I don't know, but it's 45 minutes. Oh, we got Ty Med. Are you going to the Nas event in LA? You talking to me? I'm more of a Jay Z fan than a Nas fan, so y'all can put in if y'all Jay Z fans or Nas fans. I like Nas, but I like Jay Z better. Um, so, so question about, about Tencent. So, quick before wrong, Amir, but um, Tencent uh, owns part of Fortnite. Am I correct about that? 
Yes, you know, Tencent is, is uh, you're absolutely right, a prolific investor in the game space, you know, uh, portions of Epic and Fortnite, uh, Riot, of course, that they acquired. So, you know, I think you'll find Tencent's imprint in a lot of places. So that means you was the brains behind all those cool dances at Fortnite then, right? <laughs> That was that was well before my time, and, and I, I think I think there's probably most mostly people at Epic deserve the credit for all of that. Although I'm sure okay. some Ted said people brainstormed with them perhaps at some point in time. Okay, yeah, because I have yeah. a nine year old, and she swears she knows all the dances. <laughs> so, uh, so, so talk to us about work life balance because I know you've done a great job and you're helping people with their work life balance. So. So um, how did you kind of come up with work-life balance and, and how do you kind of balance work, life, gaming on a day-to-day -day basis? It's a great question. I mean, like, you know, these are obviously very personal topics, but I think every person starts with, I'd like to think, no matter what the answer is to this question, what's the baseline of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis that's like, not just like minimum acceptable, but is like what really means a lot to me and makes me the happiest. And so for me, there's the things that are, uh, um, I will not compromise on. I insist on driving and picking up my kids from school every day. I insist on having two to three hours when my kids come home from school to have dinner with them, to do stories, to play the piano with them. <clears throat> I insist on helping put my kids to bed and reading them like their bedtime stories and doing their bath. And I insist on having an hour a day to be with my my partner, wife, Jess, to do some quality things with her. And so that gets, gets blocked in first, and that's the most important thing. Then, of course, the next most important thing after that is work. And like, I have to do what I have to do to do a bar raising job. I'm sure many feel the same way about their job and their family that I've said so far. Then I would say that the most important thing, and you may think this is like out of order, but uh, well, th this first part isn't out of order, is the LinkedIn career stuff. That's the most important. So all the LinkedIn career content and the cadence that I have on a weekly basis that many know of, that's the number one priority after that. Then it's playing games because I feel like I can't do anything in the games industry without playing games. That's my opinion. So I try to schedule 40 to 60 games a year. Um, if I have to cut on that, I do. And then finally is the remaining LinkedIn content. And so people often ask me like, well, what do you do and what gives? What usually gives is one of two things. The first thing that gives is like posting all the other stuff that maybe I would love to do, but I don't have time for long form articles, videos, all kinds of things. And the second thing that gives is just cutting back on the number of titles I can play. But, you know, I think for every person, Again, going back to that spreadsheet of what you asked, Marcus, maybe it seems a little bit eccentric, but I don't think we all take enough time to think about life in this way. Like, especially with kids, I can only probably prioritize a few things. What are they and what's my work backwards to doing it? I think if you do things in an intentional way, you'll be surprised at how much you can get done. Hmm. Very, very good information. And talk about Tencent. So everybody who tunes in, we know I kind of jump back and forth with stock charts. So we can talk about Tencent. Let me share the screen. Awesome. All right. So just like everything else in 2022, Tencent went down. So with the market, right? So it was down. People with Tencent, ooh, it went down by almost 75%. However, as long-term investors, it's an opportunity. Uh, Tencent has rebound though, right? So they're up by 62%. So you made some money back. But for those individuals, I believe over the next three years, it'll get back to where it was. And if so, that's 140% return on your money. Oh, don't delete that. Let's do it again. Let's show everybody again. 140% return. So that is literally 42% a year. I don't know about you guys as I stop sharing my screen, but 42% a year is doing five times as much as the stock market. So for you investors who wants a great company like Tencent, and I own Tencent stock myself, uh, I think three years from now, you're going to be happy about your investment. But I digress. I digress. No, no, it's a great company. And, you know, I, all, all I can say about Tencent is, you know, the reason I'm in the seat I'm in is because Tencent has decided it's a priority to invest in, you know, a sizable team of folks within North America that are specifically focused on that market, relationship building investments. And it's just a wonderful team of folks who, uh, you know, it's been a, a little bit over a month now that I've been there. So, you know, can't say much more other than that, but we're giving, we're giving it everything we can every day for both investors and to make the best games for everybody. So I, I obviously am biased, but I agree. 
yeah. In, mm -hmm. in the, the four weeks you've been there, have you, you traveled to two conferences? How how is the kind of remote work versus travel work been? It's been good. I, I have one conference. Uh, or actually, no, you're right. I went to Gamescom. You have a you have better memory than I do. This it happens when you don't sleep. Uh, I I went to Gamescom, which was really good. And I have another one coming up with the Venture Beat one. It's been really good. I mean, you know. The, the, for me, I also, and again, some people like this, so I'm nothing against it, but I'm not the type of person who wants to be home all the time either. Like, I think, you know, going out to trips, conferences, events, it's not just a favor to my employer, it's a favor to me because you can't just, it's hard to do everything just digitally. So it's been pretty good. I kind of feel like it's a little bit of consultant life, you know, uh, going back and forth. Yeah. Yeah. So, follow up question when it comes to work life balance. So, um, what are some things that you would recommend a person to see in companies? So if, if we're going through the process of being, getting hired, we're talking to maybe two or three companies, what are some signs, what are some things you would recommend uh, to pick a company that allows you to have that flexible work-life balance? Well, you know, I think it really, it really, again, depends upon what your personal priority is. Some people really value just a place that charges hard. But if you are a work-life person like me, I like to, I find when people interview, they're always very apprehensive about asking real questions about family and work-life balance. And I respect that because they're so focused on getting the job. And they think if you say anything that makes you look soft, not serious, like anything like that, it's going to cost you. My old ass, you know, being over 40, I'm like totally beyond that stuff. And like, I really care. And I think it's important to ask. So I'll throw in a few questions during the Q&A or throughout the process. I'll ask people like what they've been doing with like their families. What was the time when like the company really stepped up to like help them? And you might think, oh, you asked that from everybody. They have like a happy story to tell. But I think that if you have enough interviews, the cadence of how quickly they ask, what they say, how warm the company's support was, I feel like you learn an awful lot just doing that. But let's be honest, a lot of work oftentimes you don't know and you're taking a little bit of a chance. But I yeah. think just having the guts to ask and saying like, you know what, being with my family is important. Am I going to be traveling like, you know, every single week? Am I going to be working until like 9 p.m. every single night? Some people might think that you're being soft, but like at this point, I honestly don't care. And if like they think that I'm soft, I'd rather find that out pre-interview than like spending two years of my life at a place where I'm miserable. Right. It's, it's, a, it's, now, like just Amir, it's, it's a team culture balance. Yeah. yeah. I have to say, Amir, 40 is a new 30, man. I, I'm in my 40s as well, young 40s, but 40 is the new 30. So forever young, man, forever young. No, no Absolutely. So we have a question from Wilbur. So what would your advice be for someone like me, him, not me, to stand out when applying for opportunities in the gaming industry? Absolutely. You, you know, Wilbert, it's a really good question. And I'm, I'm reading your full comment here to take the full context of it. Right. And thank you for being an active duty military man. So, so here's what I would say, Wilbert, you know, I have a lot of empathy for people who are coming from outside the industry. As we mentioned in the intro, right, I didn't break in until I was in my mid thirties. And so as far as they were concerned, I was an outsider. And so what I always tell people is like, look, there's no magic formula. The first thing is to not play a game of self-blame that it's hard and that it takes a long time. There's no two ways about it. Now being maybe the worst time arguably ever in the history of the industry. Know that it's a crazy funnel and that even with a little bit of a connect into an org or networking or conversations, roles are like a one in 150 to one in 200 shot. So first of all, give yourself time and know everybody's facing that and you're not doing anything wrong and you're going to get a lot of rejections and don't allow yourself to personalize it. The second thing I would say is that whatever your advantage is, you have to figure out how to frame that advantage. What I usually tell people is, what are the three things that define you, define you, Wilbert, define me, Amir, Marcus, anybody that's like your selling point? What I usually try to do is my framing is that the number one is that even though I hadn't worked in games, I did have substantial experience in BD. It just didn't happen to be in games. The second thing that I tried to put up there was really trying to prove everyone says they're passionate about games, right? And that's great. You should be passionate about games, but quantifying that in something real. These are all the games that I played. These are like all the periodicals I read. This is like, I don't know, some like games event I went to like on my own time. Some people are like, are, are, come on, Amir. Like, that's like so obvious. It's not obvious. I can't tell you how many recruiters tell me they wish that someone wouldn't just be more upfront with their passion and, and manifestations of that in a real way. <clears throat> the third thing that I would say is 
I think it helps to have a hook of something that shows that you put in your personal time into actually doing something versus just talking about it. For me, obviously, as many know, I put in a lot of time on social media, originally on YouTube and on LinkedIn. Some people are like, well, I'm a developer. I'm going to make my own game. I don't care if the game sucks. If you make a game and you put it up on a platform, you made a game. Some people go to ArtStation. They show their portfolio. So I would say, you know, Find the way that you fit in and and prove that you're putting in the time, even if you haven't been able to work in games. I guess one other little thing I'll say is that um, uh, it really helps, in my opinion, to go to larger conglomerates where you can sidestep your way in. As many of you know, I finally made my step in when I was at Amazon, and that was because I found doing an internal transfer was a lot easier than applying to a studio cold. So whether it's a Google and Netflix and Amazon, if you can play that patience game and get into a larger conglomerate, I think that helps. So hopefully those are some tips, Wilbert, that are helpful. Yeah, and if I also say, Wilbert, thank you for your service. I'm actually a veteran as well. So hoorah! Um, so, uh, so we have, we have Ryan. So what stories do you have? Uh, oh, sorry, Marcus, but what so stories wait, do you wait, have wait. of folks who have LinkedIn to get work in games, please? Yeah. I mean, Ryan, you know, I can tell you that as of today, nearly 700 people that I, that I'm aware of have gotten jobs through LinkedIn using just our community's resources. That's well over 10% of everyone who lost jobs in the industry, uh, this wait, wait, year. Wait. You said 70 or 700? 700. Good Googling, Googling. Yeah. <laughs> man, somebody, yeah. well, you have a job right now, but somebody like Indeed should call you, man. They tripping. <laughs> That's awesome, man. That is awesome. No, thank you so much. Well, it's a it's really, it's a credit to our community, as I always say, and it's not something I say to be like, sweet, you know, I'm here trying to show some leadership, but it's hundreds of thousands of people who've dedicated their time to help. So the first thing I would say is the answer to that question is, I know I post on them a lot. They're updated every week, but please use our community's resources. I'm sure we'll talk about that more later, but there's all kinds of stuff from a jobs workbook, mentor network, CV review, you know, all kinds of stuff, many of which are the largest of their size in the world. So I think that's a big help. The other thing that I would just say is it really helps to just be aware of what opportunities are out there. Part of that is the jobs workbook, yes, but but part of it is just, you know, um, a specific component of that, which is when I talk to people and I have lots of conversations with people about what challenges they're having, one of the classic traps that I see people falling into is they only are applying to like the name employers that are like, I applied to Blizzard, I applied to EA. And I'm like, listen, friend, like, you know, there's over 900 companies that we have listed in the workbook. And I'm certain that that's not even everybody. So like, uh, there are well over, I'm certain, a thousand employers in game dev and publishing. If your goal is to get into game dev and publishing, be selective and don't just put trash applications out everywhere, but put in a lot of applications to a lot of places and make the sacrifice. The other thing that I would say about LinkedIn that is helpful is I want to double down on the point I said about mentorship. Our resource is there, right? It's free. All you have to do is send someone an email. I encourage you to use it. Spend a lot of time just asking people what they did to break through, right? I gave you my story of what ended up working out for me. I'm sure that is not uniform with what other people's experiences were. So those are a few ideas. Wow. Go ahead, Marcus. Yeah, and so we, we had a question. I think you may have already answered it while, while you were answering a, a previous question, but Mitchell asked, uh, what would your advice be to get into business development uh, in the, the gaming industry? And that's what you did. You, you started basically as a functional role inside of a different department and then transferred into gaming. Is that correct? That's that's exactly right. Well, let me go in maybe another direction with what you had asked, Michelle, to add a little bit of color. Specifically for BD, being where I work, and I can probably speak to this more comfortably, I think there's a few things that could give you a little bit of an edge. So I'm going to answer this more generally because some people may have more experience than others, right? BD specifically is going to have a certain set of skills that other jobs won't, won't have. Part of that is strategy. Part of that is set of skills around finance and so forth. So I would say if like my general point is if you're hitting a a wall kind of sidestep, like I said, into a large conglomerate. I would say in a BD, there's like a second layer of sidestepping, which is what are analogous jobs that you can do in other areas that might help you get into BD or BD in games. That might be doing something in like investment banking. That might be working at a consulting firm. I know a lot of people who get stuck go back to school. Like, you know, if you can afford it or get scholarship or go to a place that's more affordable, maybe you could get a, an MBA. That's like a very nice reset point. So this is just a few ideas. I would say unpack the 
BD side, from the game side, I think those are kind of two different goals. I always say to people, don't try to achieve two goals at once. Get a solid goal job in BD and then get a solid job in games. Don't try to kind of leap over them both at once. So maybe those are a few ideas on the BD side, since I already talked about the game side. Amir wanted to share your LinkedIn profile so we could go through some of those resources in more detail. But while I'm doing that, and again, everybody, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to share those in the chat. Earlier before we went live, I saw you were drinking coffee. I, I was just saying earlier that I have like a no 4 p.m. rule. Like after 4 p.m., I don't drink any more coffee or tea because <laughs> I'm already having enough trouble as it is trying to go to sleep. How, what's the latest amount of time that you will drink coffee or tea? And then for those of you tuning in live, let us know in the comments as well. Like, is there is it a 12 p.m. cutoff, 2 p.m., 3 p.m.? When do you say no more caffeine? It's really funny. I am I am like impervious to caffeine. The amount of caffeine that I have to drink to feel, feel anything is like not reasonable. So I would say I try to make a cutoff at midnight, but it like doesn't do much for me. It's kind of like drinking tea. Midnight? Yeah. <laughs> good, yeah. good wow. <laughs> wow. So, wait, let, what, let me let me follow up that with another question. How many hours of sleep do you get a night? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's I, a, I, a lot of people ask, and I want to put everyone here at peace. I don't. I'm not a vampire. I don't sleep four hours a day. I get like six, and then sometimes I get extra in the weekend. I, I've been a, I've been a light sleeper ever since I was a little kid. Yeah. Yeah. Well, six hours is good. Six yeah, hours six is good. good. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. All right, so uh, so another question from Natalie. So she has a question for all three of us, if you don't mind. What advice would you guys give a current university student pursuing a degree in gaming? What are some things I can do right now to help me out when I graduate? I still have two more years before I graduate. Sure, Natalie. Maybe I'll start, and then I'd love to hear what Marcus and Mario think, too. And you're a regular, I know, so so nice to hear from you. So, you know, for for university students... You know, I think that there's a, there's a few things to unpack here, and I'll try to do them quickly. I think one is that there's obviously a lot of internships out there. We track those in our workbook as well. Um, I've generally observed that there's between 300 to 400. So I would say be aware of where those internships are. See if there's anything you can do to make a connect, maybe even using our community's resources, if it's at a place that you want earlier rather than later. Like nothing is too early. I would say even if it's your freshman year and it's just even getting on like an unpaid project that's not an internship or even just being someone that they know exists as like a human being, do that. I would say another piece goes back to what some people had asked about how you get your leg in, right? Part of that can be doing some type of project or initiative that shows that you care. I know college feels kind of early. College is kind of early. But again, art station, make a game, do something, write articles, put, put together a blog you have, even if you have something you can show them. The final thing I would say is like, you know, and I, I know I'll get in trouble with some people at the college level who like don't like this concept. I know college is not trade school. And for many people, the idea that college's purpose is for you to get a job is something they don't agree with. I think it's both. I think college is a very great time to learn and to improve yourself and to develop a love of learning for a lifetime. But I also think that you should be developing tangible skills that you could use to get a job. And so I would say that what I kept saying to myself every day I was in college or in graduate school is, why am I taking this course as long as it's not a core requirement where I didn't have a choice? What am I learning? What am I going to be able to do with it? I'm paying a heck of a lot of money. It should be really useful. So I would challenge you to be very ruthless as early as you can about what types of things you want to do, what you want to major in, and what you're learning that has tangible impact for what you can do in your job. And if you're not sure, again, this might be a time to ask a mentor or to ask somebody in a career office. So those are a few ideas. I, I want to let Mario and Marcus jump in. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, I jump in. Now, I'm kind of biased. Uh, I'm actually uh, on the foundation board of my alma mater, Tennessee State University. So we support our HBCUs. Um, now, when I was in school, I, I came in in 2000, got out in 05. Like the internet and opportunities is not like it is now. But I would definitely say, A, get your grades. But most important, you want to create and network. Um, networking is huge. It's people that I still have in contact with now that are now clients. Uh, one of my friends did my estate planning for me years later. So like the more people that you're able to talk to, create, create blogs, try to start a business just because you're young with no responsibilities. I would say after you make the grades, just do whatever you can to create and network. And then when you're our age, you know, 20 years later, you know, you'll feel good about your experience in college. 
Yeah, I would echo both uh, what, what Amir and Mario said. And to add to that, I think when you're in school, you have the opportunity. It might be feel a little uncomfortable, or a little challenging for you, but go to your professors and ask them for the assignments that they're they're requiring you to submit. How can you modify the assignment so it's applicable to like your interest in gaming, right? So if you have to do like a report or a presentation, can you focus it on a game studio or a trend that's happening in the industry? So you're actually getting your grades and building your portfolio. That's number one. Number two, I would recommend trying to seek out like the gaming and esports organizations on campus if it's a student organization and at least become a member and potentially try to work your way into a leadership role because that's again you're, you're doubling down on that and getting that leadership experience and then the third thing third slash fourth is that in every community there's some component of you know the gaming and esports industry it may not be you know as as prominent as la or new york but basically given that there's over 3 billion gamers and, and you know, hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions, hundreds of thousands of games, maybe millions of games, there are game development studios and opportunities in, in practically every community. So if you have like um, a, a cosplay event or a gaming conference, how can you volunteer at those events and do some networking while you're, you're getting that industry experience? And then the last piece of that is over 75% of all video games in the global industry are made by independent game developers. Those are basically small businesses where the developers have a nine to five job and they make their games on nights and weekends. They are, there is no shortage of their need for people to help them finish their game. So if you wanna look in your local community, connect with an independent game developer, you can actually get real world experience and potentially work into a full-time job opportunity with that same studio once you're ready to graduate. That those are great comments, guys. And, and as you were saying those, one more thing jumped into my mind, which is, you know, you've heard me talk a lot today already about like even knowing the restrictions you have, what things you can always do to make yourself a better games candidate that nobody can take away from you. And I would say two things in that category are, and I think I made a post about this recently and we could share this if interested for people. But one is constantly reading about the industry. No one can take away from your ability to read tons of articles. You can read, you know, Games Industry Biz. You can read IGN. You can read GameSpot, PC Gamer, et cetera. You can just go into forums and see what people are saying about games. On the other side is playing games, right? No one can take away from you just playing as many games as you can. Like, it's great if you love COD or you love League or whatever, but just play more games and play a higher diversity of games. Like, when I didn't have kids and I wasn't married, heck, I probably played like 100 games a year because my goal was, well, what? It was super, super fun. But my goal was to experience as many developers, as many publishers, as many genres as possible, right? And imagine you come out of school and you were doing all this reading and playing all these games and I'm totally making up something at random. The only company that like has a job is a company that makes like puzzle games. And they're like, so have you played any puzzle games? And like, let's say you played like six and you like, you've read all about them and someone else hasn't, like that means something. Is that gonna replace everything else? No, but it means something, I think. I see folks answering and, and providing their own advice in the comments as well. So if you, you have any experience or, or insights you'd like to share, we invite you to share those in the comments. So thank you for doing that. Uh, Amir, we have your LinkedIn profile loaded up here. Uh, can you talk through some of those resources? Um, I, sure, I sure can. So, so everybody, you know, folks ask all the time, like Amir, so what are all these resources? Like, how do I engage? And so I decided at some point, thank you, Natalie, for your comment. That's so sweet. Uh, so uh, I, I decided to make things as simple for everybody as possible. So you want to know where to go. First of all, I, of course, appreciate your follow. But then if you want to know where to go, right? Look at my name and you'll see there's a link that says video games, career resources. I update that link every single week. And as Marcus clicks through on it, you'll see that where that link is going to take us is, it will always take us to the latest post of all our community's resources. Our community has seven jobs resources, and I'll very quickly explain what these are. The job seekers workbook is you go to a Google form. It takes like literally 30 seconds. You put in some information about yourself and what you're doing, and you can put yourself on a list for recruiters and hiring managers to find you. We have over 7,000 people on that list. The second resource, which we started in the last week or two, because I was just getting so sick and tired of the number of specifically. So the first one is for anybody, right? You don't have to even be in games for that one. The second one is just is a similar exercise, but just for people in games who were laid off in the past year. And so we have almost 700 people on that list. We just started a week ago, which is pretty nuts. Um, the third one is our mentorship resource. We have over uh, 550 people 
who have signed up as mentors to give a 30 minute conversation to anybody who wants one to talk about your career, anything that you want. There's not much to it. It's pretty simple. You just go to the list. You can sign up as a mentor if you want. And if you want to connect with a mentor, you click on that list, you send them a LinkedIn message. I just always ask understanding because you can imagine these people are doing it for free and they get a lot of contacts. So sometimes they can't connect with anybody, everybody. So I say, if you write two or three people and you don't get a response, maybe wait a week and then try somebody else. I think most people, by the time they do five or six outreaches, find a mentor. The next one is CV and LinkedIn reviewers. This is like the mentorship, but we specifically carved it out because we saw there were a lot of requests for CV, LinkedIn review, or in the case of art and other things, portfolio reviews. So this is the same idea, but you're reaching out for someone specifically for a review of those things. Five is the one that's probably the most famous within our community. This is the largest list of games jobs in the world, which is curated, aggregated, and processed through a semi-automated process so that all jobs are organized across 21 job categories in a standardized way. And so you can look at this. Uh, there's, uh, you know, over 900 companies, over 13,000 jobs. It'll hopefully help you find the job you're looking for. The sixth one, which again yeah, has been going on all year and we've done over 40 of is what I call the games org support post. So if you know anyone at an org and 10 to 100 people were laid off, why 10 to 100? I found that for less than 10 people, it doesn't work particularly well because that's a small number of people. And for over 100, there's so many people that we kind of can't cast the spotlight on everybody. So if you're in an org, I have a template there of exactly what template to give me the information of everybody in your org. I standardize it, edit it, and then post it and make sure at least 100,000 people see it. And then the final one is a set of career job resources that I made myself that live in Dropbox, all kinds of stuff on how to plan your career, how to plan for jobs, uh, a whole bunch of material there that also ties the other resources together. So that's it. And every single week, you'll see a post like basically what Marcus is showing now. I change the colors every week, just so everyone knows it's a new post. And then I make a second post each week, again, specifically just on that resource five for the games jobs workbook, because I know it's very, very important to a lot of people. So you can count on those two posts every single week. And again, thankfully, you know, nearly 700 jobs placed thousands and thousands of interviews earned and uh, just a testament to the whole community. Again, I just try to play a leader role, but it's about the community, not about me. Okay. Wait, 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 wait. Amazing. First off, have to ask, what is your passion? Because you are helping a lot of people. So you had to wake up one day and say, I'm going to do this. What made you do it? And what is your passion to continue to do this with the job that you have, kids, family? What is your passion? That's a really great question. And it's actually probably the most important part of why this thing exists. Um, the passion is after my family and friends, like the people in my life, the thing that I love the most in the world is video games, <laughs> That's the, <laughs> which everyone here knows. It's like the most obvious statement in the world, right? But the second part of that is last Thanksgiving, which is when all of this started, I was talking to my wife and all the layoffs were starting. And I said to her, you know, we like talk to developers and publishers that we love. And we say, oh man, I loved your game. Like, you know, you're the best. Like, you know, we write a post to talk about how great the game is. That's really nice. But I was like, that doesn't cut it when someone's lost their job and has to sell their house and can't feed their family because like they don't have a job in the industry anymore. And so I said to myself, if I really love games, if I really love the games industry, the real way to show that gratitude the number one thing is to actually make people to sure that people have a job because like it, it, that cuts directly to it. And so I think that's the passion. It's all, it all starts with the games and the people who make them and trying to find the most direct, meaningful way to help those people and to show gratitude for what they do. Thank you for doing that. And Patrick, we, we see your question. I just posted a link in the chat for LinkedIn that goes directly to that post. So you have to, I don't know if it's a hyperlink, you may have to copy it and paste it back into your browser, but it's a link directly to that post. But Amir, thank you for your passion for, for putting all that together, right? You're, you're helping thousands and, and maybe tens of thousands of people. And certainly your community has grown to tens of thousands of people, right? And, and you, you said you started in November last year. Can you share some insight on on the impact that's had on the community that you've helped lead and build 
Yeah, well, I mean, you know, look, I think obviously the community size has grown tremendously. We we had, I think, 10,000 people, something like that a year ago, and now we've grown to 53. And I think that beyond just the... <laughs> we cannot sugarcoat that, Amir. You went from 10,000 to 50,000 in less than a year? Yeah, yeah. No, it's been really cool. And But I think that, you know, I think that the most important thing is, you know, and, and I really mean this from the bottom of my heart, it's like really like chicken soup for the soul for me too. Like everyone is like, yeah, yeah. You know what's, you know what's the thing I love about our community and about the games community on LinkedIn? I feel like people who don't know what we're doing, especially now that the network has gotten bigger, they'll come and they'll be like, oh yeah, the games jobs resources, Amir, we heard about you, or maybe we saw like an article about it. And I'm like, yeah. That's like the first layer of the onion. The second layer of the onion is just being there for each other and supporting each other, right? So only like a third of what I post is jobs content. That's what most people who know me or maybe know the channel are aware of. The other two thirds is, as you both know, like ruminations on life, writing about like video games, having fun, posting like silly shit. And so I think, and this is what my community members tell me when I ask them to ask them for feedback, that element of being in a safe space, I don't allow toxic content. I immediately block people if they flame someone. I only want to see pos constructive positivity. Although if it's positive and constructive, people can come at me hard on anything they want. Awesome. That community tone is as important, more important to me than the resources in making people feel supported and loved while they look for work. And then the third layer of the onion, I think, is I think that the actual content beyond the game stuff, I think, again, some people find it interesting, insightful, maybe like helpful. So I would say that it's this combination of things that I think has helped. So when you ask what's the impact, yes, I can quote all kinds of stats of like how many people have been helped with this and that and the other, having had like thousands of mentorship conversations, jobs placed and so forth. But I would like to believe the real storyline here is creating a real community of gamers on LinkedIn that makes people feel like they're included and loved and valued every single day. And now that I'm like in person and saying that rather than typing, people can see that I mean it. That's not some like bullshit pablum or something like that. So, so let's take that a step further. So um, going from 10 to 53, what advice would you give a person who's trying to build a platform? They're trying to create a platform, either engagement or a mean platform, whatever, like what would be one, piece of advice you would give them to help them scale and grow their platform? You know, it, it's very interesting. It again kind of goes back to similar to what we've talked about, about work-life balance or going after your career, right? It, <coughs> excuse me, depends upon who you are and what you're trying to achieve. Like, again, I don't mean this in any type of a negative way at all. In the same way that some people, their career is everything to them. Some people, their family is everything to them. Most people are somewhere in between. Some people who are on social media, and I'm just, I personally am not good at this at all, right? If you're like like the big ass numbers and the millions, billions, like, you know, Mr. Beast or whatever, right? Some people post like entertaining stuff like that, or they post about like whatever. That itself is a significant skill. It doesn't happen to be a skill that I have, but it's a skill people have. I would say that for the type of content that I've made and that work, work for me, which might not work for everybody is, I think it helps. And, and, you know, you two are doing this right now with this channel, right? I think that's why you're both very beloved people. Marcus is a very beloved person. I think it's because it's a combination of having fun stuff that's entertaining, but also having something that you give people that is tangible, that helps them advice, a product, a resource all wrapped in an identity that is authentic for your channel. I'm like a very energetic person. I'm very kind of like over the top and eccentric. I can't hide how passionate I am about games and gamers. I think that's kind of like the brand and the flavor. Uh, sometimes it's over the top. I happen to know for a fact there are like Discord channels where some people who don't like me, even some people who do like me, will say after some post that I make that, oh my God, I mean, that post was like so cringe. I'm like, you know what? I don't care. Like, you know, I'm, I'm, every day when I get up every week, I write the type of posts that I think that my friends and my family would be proud to read and are the types of real conversations that I have with them. So I would say be authentic, stick with it, Put in the work to put in a lot of content that's high value, find your voice and have something that's not just you giving speeches every day. Like have something that you're actually giving people that's real. 
Well, you know, when you have a Discord channel that talks about you, that's when you made it. So. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that was the top voice accolade. It, it was people talking trash about you in Discord. That's uh, that's very true. So, all right, so let's get back to these questions because they have been amazing. Um, While he's looking for a question, go. Amir. Oh, and, and by the way, Mar Marcus, forgive, not, not to interrupt you, forgive me, Marcus. I wanted to say for you two, I want to be respectful of your time, but I blocked out like literally the next hour and a half. So I'm happy to go as long as you guys want on questions you can go over. I'm happy to go over. Please go ahead, Marcus. I didn't mean to interrupt you. I'm sorry. No, no problem. Oh, just, so all, all that coffee you're drinking, huh? <laughs> question about like your strategy for content. On average, per week, how many posts to LinkedIn do you publish? Because I know I think like the the standard that LinkedIn recommends is like maybe maybe one one per day, like seven per week. I, I typically do like two per day, so I average about ten to fifteen per week. But I think uh -oh. you, you probably do more than ten to fifteen per week. <laughs> I, I I post I post a lot. I I would say, as you know, Marcus, because of our like groups that we chat with, I would say for people who have like more eyeballs like us, I probably post a lot more than average. Again, that's a calculated strategy. It means I have some clunkers, but I'm proud of everything that gets posted. Um, uh, I post. I I think my average over the last year is ninety posts a month. So I do about three posts a day okay and, and again the, the key yeah. there is is quality over quantity yes you are doing three posts per day but you're making sure that you're adding meaningful value not just you know noise and and, and i can appreciate that because when i started project mq my last company uh, i have a twin brother identical twin brother we were solving game discovery worldwide mm. uh, and we built we created the number one uh, indie game influencer for twitter's global ecosystem and i was averaging about four posts per day but I, I built a strategy so that it was um, manageable, sustainable, but also value add. I wasn't creating noise. Each of those four posts per day was something of value. Yeah. And part of the work backwards is like, you know, all of this stuff is an intricate puzzle, right? Because I do so much of the career stuff, I think that the volume has to be higher because if half the posts I did were career stuff. I think, frankly, even though it's useful, I think it would be pretty annoying. I think people would tune out pretty quickly. Also, I don't post, which again, some people do and some people don't. The only platform I post on anywhere is LinkedIn. I don't use Meta, Twitter, Zap, Blap, like, you know, whatever all the things are. All I do is LinkedIn. So I think I also can keep up that volume because I'm not doing anything else. <laughs> Agreed, agreed. When I, I, yeah. we, we had the Project MQ account, it was only on Twitter and the work that I do with my content is only on LinkedIn. I've actually tried posting the same content on LinkedIn on Facebook and I get no engagement from my friends and family because they don't care. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, it is funny how that stuff isn't one size fits all. I mean, it really is pretty amazing, isn't it? So, you know, uh, the granddaddy of posting is MySpace. And MySpace is no longer here, but we got Facebook. So let's go to the screen and go over Facebook stock because we talk about posting. So I have a gym for you guys, right? We all know Facebook and Facebook went down like crazy last year. It went down by, oh, almost 80%. But then Zuckerberg started doing jujitsu and he said, I'm going to heal the world in 100 years and get rid of all the diseases. And Facebook has shot up. But you guys, I have to tell you, though, 240%. If you guys like to invest a little bit more riskier, it's actually a symbol tied to Facebook called FBL. Facebook, boy, Larry, and it basically makes 1.5% of Facebook. So if Facebook goes up by 1%, you make 1.5%. If Facebook goes up by 10%, you make 15%. Facebook went up by 220%. This went up by 283%. So if you guys want to invest, not do options because they're risky, <laughs> but get some juice in Facebook. I would recommend FBL because it allows you to be in Facebook, but also have some more juice to the upside. But I digress, though. Amir, do you do in investments? I know we had talked before about your, your saving strategy. Do you do if if you, you don't invest? Can you talk a little more about your saving strategy? And if you do invest, if you talk a little about that as well? I do. You know, it's actually really, really funny. My dad, uh, my dad was a doctor. But, you know, and I promise this is going somewhere, but, you know, my family came from Iran. And so there, you know, the idea of being like an investor or working in business, let's just say when my dad was growing up was not as accessible of a career. And so that became his lifelong passion, which was like, you know, 
reading uh, all like the Bloomberg stuff and value lied when we were younger and being a CNBC junkie. And my dad is actually a really great investor, I think, and um, taught all of those skills to many in our family and to me. And so uh, I, I, I have always tried to do my own investments and love doing that. Uh, but I'm a fun person only. So I have everything in high quality growth stock funds with Vanguard. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. We're talking stocks now. <laughs> now Vanguard's good. Vanguard owns And low fee. Low fee. Yeah. Oh, part of me. Yeah. 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 You're not. Yeah. yeah. You're not. They definitely have the lowest fees, you know. So you may not know this, but I actually have my own fund on the stock market. The symbol is LETB. Uh, so I definitely. Uh, a investment was money, but they have my own foot on the stock market. But Vanguard's cool though. Vanguard's no, it's cool. cool. VTI, yeah, and, 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 and yeah, finding yeah. and finding good CFPs, right? You know, I think I think the reason I'm loving this conversation is like you know, again, I realize that was kind of like a pretty interesting and eccentric upbringing that I had, right? Lots of people do need help, and so you know, I think yeah. that whether it's choosing high quality funds for Vanguard or Fidelity, you can choose very high quality financial planners. So I think I think it's just about you know having that help, no matter what corner you get it from, and yeah, good stuff. Uh, so then, let's keep this conversation going. So uh, yeah. why high quality? Because especially in gaming, you have individuals that are more risky. They like the more like the penny stocks, you know, the the high, high fly by night per se tech stocks. Like so for you, from an investment standpoint, why the high, which is good, in my opinion, but why more of the high quality <laughs> stocks and, or dividend paying stocks? So I, I believe uh, based upon everything I've read and learn again, both in college and grad school and so forth. And being like a finance major, I, I'm convinced that basically like the Jeremy, classic Jeremy Siegel, Peter Lynch thing, I don't think you can beat mathematically for the risk level of returns, uh, being in high quality, long equity. I think that there are certain vehicles that can beat that, but they're not accessible for most people who aren't high net worth investors. Like if I had my cousin here, who's like a partner at KKR, like if you can park your money in a PE fund, I'm sure you could get several points above the S&P 500 yeah. index. That's but if you're, not, if you're not a high net worth accredited investor, I think most things like... You you both know, I'm sure, like there was a famous study, I'm forgetting now where, but that showed that like over 10 year period or longer, like 98% of hedge funds even can't beat the index funds. So I yeah. feel like it's it's hard to beat the index funds is my, my short conclusion. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's why the Oracle of Omaha, Mr. Warren Buffett says himself, mm -hmm. uh, if you're not going to do his investment, <laughs> Berkshire halfway do the <laughs> index fund because you're better off. So talk about investing and with gamers and gamers are synonymous with crypto. So what is your thoughts about cryptocurrency? Oh God, you know, I, I am very, um, uh... I'm, I am very cautious. You know, you'll see that everything I say today, I'm always like a very couched and cautious person because I have very, very rarely are things universally good or universally bad. I'll just say that there's sometimes things where it's like not my thing and it's someone's, not someone else's thing. So I would say the big three of crypto, and these are not similar things, they're different things, but the big three for me of crypto, NFTs, and Web threes, I leave to other folks. I am, <laughs> I am, I am a non-participant in those areas, let's just say. Not that they're bad, not, not any negative adjectives, just not for me. Yeah, I'm pretty sure a lot of people tuning in that's working on Web3 projects as we speak, so they might have another opinion. But yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when it, when it comes to crypto, I'm, um, I'm definitely not anti-crypto, but I'm definitely pro-Bitcoin. Like I tell individuals, you know, because of NFTs and, and the scams, the deep fakes, the deep state of the deep fake uh, that's out there, like I don't recommend them. But with Bitcoin, like Bitcoin is the granddaddy of them all. In my humble opinion, I think Bitcoin is the future. Uh, I think Bitcoin is going to continue to beat the market. I'm not telling you put all your money in Bitcoin, no more than 5% as a CFP, no more than 5%. But definitely, um, if you do want to get in crypto, uh, Bitcoin, in my opinion, is the safest, not the safe, but the safest way, way to go. But uh, yeah, great conversation. Look at that. Look at that. Let's look at that. Okay. Oh, uh, we got some money signs in here. All right. So, have you ever thought about starting a nonprofit? Because you you're growing your community, you're helping people. I know you have a wonderful job at Tencent. But have you thought about maybe on the side, you know, starting a nonprofit and, and kind of scaling more? You know, I've considered it. Hours in the day. 
Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I have considered it. I, I, um, you know, the, 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 the thing at this point in time is <clears throat> I, I don't have an idea that I think would benefit from the scalability of a nonprofit that would add enough material value where I think it would be worth the time. Like, so one, one thing that was one of the core design philosophies for me around, for example, the resources that we have for the channel is I spent a lot of time before I even did those resources, having conversations with 20, 30 different people who had done stuff around building their own like mods, building their own similar like community services and so forth. And one of the biggest lessons that I learned from that is they imparted on me, which was one of my two or three core design philosophies, is that like simpler is better. I think a lot of people get bound up in making like a really elaborate website, making it like really sleek, making it like so forth and so on. And I would say that the only technical innovation that really is in any of the resources our community has, and I do think that's a technical innovation, is the way that the Games Jobs Workbook does its magic behind the scenes with the scraping and the macros to basically turn all the data on the internet into an integrated and clean set of data. Everything else that I do is literally so simple that like a caveman, a cave person could do it. It's like all... It's all like Google Docs and linking people together. And so I don't think that stuff works because like I need more funding or more resources. I think it works because I think our community has a specific brand and trust that people have, that people are like, I'll sign up to be a mentor for that. The number one piece of feedback that I get from everybody in our community, and I believe in this deeply too, is the minute that they see anything that smells of monetization or like profit or anything, like they're out. And so even nonprofit to me, I worry about it being a slippery slope. Uh, a lot of people think that I'm very eccentric about this point, and I know I am, but there's a reason why I won't let anybody help me on any of the resources. And the main reason why is one of the other core design philosophies that I learned from people is a number of instances where they had an idea for something creative and it was a passion project. And the moment they brought in a partner or someone else to help, they said, oh, no, no, I'm in this too. I'm with you. And then eventually the person took the idea and turned it into something to make money off of. And so I'm extremely protective. I'm not letting the stuff that I've done for the jobs workbook be seen by anybody because I'm too worried they might commoditize it. And so I often joke that our channel is not only nonprofit, it's what I call, I, I, my, my made up term is zero profit because my distinction is for profit is the organization makes money and the people in it get paid. In nonprofit, the organization doesn't make money, but the people in it get paid. In my zero, in my zero profit organization, the organization doesn't make money, and I don't make any money either. So it's like it's very easy, and it works. So that's that's my answer to that. Yeah, <laughs> that is very, very, very true when it comes to nonprofits. Yeah, I've, I've been I've been blessed to be a financial advisor of some nonprofits, and they do great work. But definitely, the people who work for those, they uh they get compensated. So like take uh, hospitals, right? A hospital is a nonprofit. The heads of hospitals get paid like $5 million a year. So I'm just saying, I'm saying nonprofit, it, it's fine. And like nonprofit organizations are fine. But like, I, 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 I'm very happy with things being the way they are, at least for now. Yeah. And the words of Don King, only in America. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amir, did, did, you, did you learn the code? I assume that you had to have coded the macros. And maybe I'm wrong. And and if you learn to code, when did you start learning to code and, and um, help people contextualize the amount of technology that's powering the solution for the community? Yeah. So uh, so I I have been into Excel and Visual Basic and macros and so forth for a long time. I kind of got interested in that in high school. Uh, I had an internship with a wealth management firm around where we lived in Connecticut. And so I've always been passionate about that stuff. And, you know, it helped that I, my first job out of college was like a, an analyst program in investment banking. So I, I developed a lot of those skills and kind of ran with it. So th that's where the Excel stuff came from. Uh, on the other side, <coughs> 
for the scraping, I didn't know very much about that at all, but there's some prepackaged tools that some friends taught me how to mod. So I'm not like a programmer in that type of sense. I know enough to make it work for what I do. And just for anyone who doesn't know, um, and again, I'll try to make this very brief. So like the way that the tool works is it, uh, I basically have people volunteer me job pages for companies. I map that with a combination of scraping and Excel. So once I know what the hierarchy of the page looks like, it pulls all the data in and what it's called. This is important because a role might be called one thing in one org versus another. In fact, across our 930 orgs in the Games Jobs Worksbook, I think there's 700 different job categorizations that I mash together into 21. And so that's why when people are like, oh, let me send you this individual role. I'm like, sorry, I just can't do it. Like it's not scalable. I can only do it off job pages. And then what happens is it uses statistics to guess an affinity of what category a job should go in. If the confidence threshold is not high enough, that's where the manual part comes in, where I have to go in and spot check just a few of them to make sure that they're completely accurate. And then it gets spit out and it does it all of Excel stuff. So that's how it works. The outliers, when you talk about just a few of them, are we talking 15? Are we talking 400? Because you have 13,000 jobs, right? <laughs> of 13,000 jobs, I have to manually check somewhere between 500 to 1,000 of them each week, which sounds like a lot. But because I have a lot of macros that go beyond that, it's actually not too bad. It takes me like somewhere between two to four hours a week, something like that. It's not too bad. So on the channel in totality, how many hours a week do you spend? Which is just great showing your community how much you love to help people. But how many hours a week do you think you're spending on, um, on the channel and on the community? I would say in weeks when I have the time, I spend probably, I'd say like 10 to 15 hours a week is about the total time I spend. And I would say again, in weeks where I'm busy, family, camp, because of work, the number one thing I cut is I cut like the entertainment non-jobs content. But I would say I make sure that there's like five hours a week, basically no matter what, to make sure those two job posts get out. And then depending upon how much free time I have or if I'm traveling in the airport or whatever, another five to 10 hours to make everything else. Oh, and, and I should ask, I beg your pardon. I should add that that five hours does not include, it's probably actually two or three hours more than that just because of the volume of in-mails that I get. And I actually have some add-ons that help me manage that too. This is why like people are like, are you, did you just make another FAQ post on like what to send you? And I'm like, you don't understand. I get like 500 to 1,000 in-mails a week. So it's like, please don't write me for stuff that I can't help you on. Just like go to the resources. Don't ask me for individualized mentoring. I'd like to, but I just can't. So anyway, sorry, keep going. Yeah. No, this is awesome. And I think this shows a community um, because we look at how successful you are and it's good to kind of peel back the layers and see why. So it's like sacrifice. So um, I know M Magic Johnson was talking about his, his regiment. Like, you know, he gets up uh, at four o'clock every single morning and he works out for an hour, waits. And then for another hour, he does cardio. And that from six to eight, it's all research about business. And then at eight, that's when he starts doing media and stuff. And he goes to sleep at 10. So he basically gets six hours, but he's like so regimented. So you don't see the sacrifice of him working out, getting the blood pumping, doing exercises, and then researching before he actually goes to his business. So it's good to see like the sacrifice. So a lot of times we look at success and people doing great things like yourself. We don't see the sacrifice. We don't know about the sacrifice. So it's good for you to kind of let us know what you have done. So you can see if you do put in the work, put in the hours, Drink the coffee, <laughs> have six hours of sleep. Over time, you become successful, and what you're doing is, is pretty amazing. Thank you. No, and, and you know, I think there's a very important point in what you said, which is like we've been talking about kind of like what are individual people's strategies for growing their community. If I tie that together with the point I said about kind of why I do it myself, another reason I do it myself is <clears> – <throat> <clears throat> boy, you like have to have a vocation for something that you want to do to do it every week 
for like months and years for no money that like, honestly, sometimes it's mind numbing work, but it's not mind numbing because you're like, I know how many, I can feel the people who are going to benefit from doing this. I think you have to find what that is for you. Like you and Marcus have clearly found a number of different things that you both do that give you that passion. I have mine. Someone else may have their own. You can't fake doing someone else's passion because you'll do that for a week or 10 weeks or 20 weeks and you'll get bored. And this is in fact, what I learned from a lot of people, which is like, if I had someone help me with the workbook, those 20, 30 people I told you that I talked about, they're like, it won't work. You'll get to like week 10 and the person will be like, this sucks. And they'll either be like, where's my credit? Or like, where's my money? Or, or I just, I don't want to do this anymore. This, this sucks, you know? And so, and I don't expect that. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't ask my worst, my worst enemy to have to do the data compilation for this. Cause it's really a pain in the ass, but I love, I love doing it. Cause I'm a little crazy. Yeah. Let's get back to games. Uh, I know we, we you, you offered us some extra time, so thank you for that. And, and, and I don't want to monopolize that about Wind Waker HD, but can you tell us why <laughs> Zelda Wind Waker HD is so amazing and why it needs to be ported? <laughs> yeah, so what Marcus is referring to for anyone who doesn't follow the channel closely is like, I've, I've, I guess I've succeeded in like generating this constant meme of trying to work references into why Nintendo hasn't ported that game like at least five times a week. So I... <laughs> I have played a lot of games. I played over 2000 games in my life. There are a lot of them that I really love. And if you particularly get into the top 10 or 15, it's hard to choose. But my number one, since I played it on GameCube, <coughs> has been Zelda Wind Waker. And then it's uh, updated version on, on the Wii U. The reason I'm so passionate about that game is, first of all, I love Nintendo. It's my favorite developer of all time. Within that, I love Zelda. It's not only my favorite series, but it is objectively the highest average Metacritic series in games history. I think it's like a 93 on average for that series, which is crazy if you think about that. Um, I think Wind Waker is the best. I think that the art style that they have, uh, the, the, the cell shaded style that many derided at the time, I think is truly timeless and beautiful, especially the minimalism of it. When you see like the little waves on the water, I think that the overall construct of having like a ship and going from the island to island is very bite-sized, but gives that sense of grandeur and exploration. I think, you know, the encounters and the little stories in the game are just fantastic. It's just great. I think, I think like, before there was Skyrim, before there was The Witcher 3, I think it was like the ultimate open world game. And it still persists for me because, again, I think it's just so timeless. But I have to admit part of it is a bias for um, Nintendo and Zelda. But I find it particularly ridiculous because literally every single Mario Zelda title of any significance is now on Switch, except for Twilight Princess and except for Wind Waker HD. So it's like, why? Like, you know, I don't know. Well, my daughter plays enough Switch as it is. So we, we want to make sure that when, when not just playing. But, uh, but so again, uh, a caveat talk about gaming. You talked about The Witcher. H have you seen uh, the Netflix um, show, The Witcher? Have you seen that? You know, it's shamefully, I've watched a few episodes, but not the whole thing. And people give me a hard time about it on a daily basis. So I have to rectify yeah. that soon. Yeah. Because I, I always ask gamers, like, what, what is your thought? And you think it's authentic? Is it not authentic? Like, what, what, what are your thoughts about the episodes that, that you've seen? Of what I've seen, I think it's really great. You know, I think I think we're in a golden era of adaptations of media, whether it's like the movies like Super Mario. I thought The Witcher, I was really, really fun. Uh, the Last of Us, I thought was really good. I watched a good bit of that, too. I think it's I think it's pretty great. I really do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Much, much better than the original Super Mario Brothers movie from like 1980. <laughs> Much better. Yeah, much yeah, better. yeah, much yeah. Better. No, that was that was really good. I, I really love the Mario movie. I really did. So what, what games are you playing now? I know that you, you, you said you cover, I guess, 60 games a year. Mm -hmm. uh, what, what games are you, you currently working on or, or working through? And can you talk about the Amir Awards? Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh -huh. So 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 right now I'm uh, I'm working through uh, I, I'm working through finishing a few titles that I like reviewed. Right. So when you play enough games, and <clears throat> I know everyone's approach is different, but I used to have a bunch of friends, still a few, who actually review games like professionally, and so 
you get a mindset. And I actually asked many of them when I kind of researched how to think about my playtime is that you, you become kind of ruthless in what you play. I feel like there's finishing like the main story. Uh, there's a hundred percenting a game and there's somewhere between those two things where you've seen like enough of the game where you feel confident that you can write a review. And so oh. I would say that most of my gameplay these days and it waxes and wanes is <clears throat> getting some games to that review level and playing a bit more of the ones that I reviewed mostly for my personal enjoyment to go to a hundred percent. So I reviewed Starfield, but I wanted to play it some more. So I'm playing some Starfield. I have to admit I'm replaying Dave the Diver just because I'm completely obsessed with that game. Um, I am playing, I still have to get, I still have to play more of Final Fantasy 16. So I'm playing some of that. And those are the three main ones right now. I'm kind of biding my time. And then a few other titles I won't say anything about because I'm getting them to review level. So I'll keep that a surprise. But October 20th is the big date for me because uh, Super Mario Wonder is coming out and I'm extremely excited about that. Now for the Amir Awards, and I'll go first, Slurker, why I mentioned Super Mario Wonder last there is. So everyone who doesn't know, if you go to my YouTube channel which is youtube.com backslash C backslash my full name, Amir Satvat. I have a YouTube channel, like 4,000 followers, something like that. Basically what it is, is it's a repository for content that's too long in video form for what I can post on LinkedIn. And so ever since I was, um, I was in, oh, I want to say 12, 11, 12, something like that. Every year I would pick like my favorite game of the year and like one or two other awards. And I would have an award show with my mother and my father for like the games I played that year. As I got older and I got to like high school age, I started actually, again, truly just for my own amusement, writing up different games and different genres and what I enjoyed. And I have a long Excel list of every game I've ever played by like how good I thought it was, a few comments. And when I get older, I went back and retroactively filled some of that in. I'm mentioning all that because eventually I thought, well, this little show that I've been doing for myself and my friends, I bet if I turned it into a broadcast, people would find it amusing. So last year for the first time, I produced an 80 minute show where in 26, 27 categories, if I recall, and a few special awards and other entertainment in between, I made a whole games award show, which if you haven't watched, you should go to YouTube. It's the first video that comes up on my channel and it's like a lot of fun. Um, uh, and, uh, and, uh, that was great. And so I'm going to do it again this year. The reason I mentioned Super Mario Wonder is because the number one thing people ask me every year is what I'm going to pick for game of the year. And of course I can't say, but there's like too many good competitors. And so I hope Super Mario Wonder will be another worthy competitor in that list. So Amir, so did you bring out the tuxedo? Like what, what was you dressed as? So a big part of the show is that I decided I would make fun is to wear something totally over the top. So last year I wore a suit that had a ridiculous Mario print all over it. And this year I have a leather Hyrule jacket that's really, really loud. And so each year I also decided that this year uh, for the second year of the show, I thought that it would be fun to tie a fundraiser to it. So we're doing a $10,000 fundraiser for Connecticut Children's Hospital, our local children's hospital. And I've decided that everyone who enters will be entered into a ballot to win my outfit that I wore that year. So this year, since I didn't do it last year, both, both of the two outfits will be given away at random. Collectors cool. items. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's, that's awesome. So, so what what made you um uh, pick the Children's Hospital? Well, you know, my my father, as I mentioned, was a uh, was a doctor, uh, not a child's doctor. He was like he was an OBGYN downtown, but. Uh, my uncle was a doctor too. A lot of our family and friends were doctors, nurses, other things in the area. So Hartford Hospital, our local adult hospital and Connecticut Children, which is right next door, that whole ecosystem uh, is very important to our family. Just a little way of giving back. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Hmm. And again, that, that, that goes to your passion. That goes to your passion. So that's awesome. Yeah, I love Connecticut. I eccentric loves, right? I love. I don't know which is which, loving games. I guess is not that eccentric. Maybe it is loving it as much as I do. I think loving Connecticut is pretty eccentric. I don't know other people who love Connecticut. My family's been here for over forty years. So what can I tell you? So, so, so you wasn't out uh, 
the destroying cars when the, when the Connecticut Huskies won the national championship this year, was you? <laughs> oh, man, the Huskies are pretty great. I'm just glad we still have them because, of course, living where I do, for anyone who's a hockey fan out there, we actually don't have any professional sports teams in Connecticut anymore. We had one when I was a kid, which was the Hartford Whalers in hockey, but they left in 96, 97 to go to Carolina and funny enough, won the Stanley Cup a few years after that. But since they're not there, yeah, the men's and women's Huskies are the biggest show in town for sure. Mm -hmm. I want to make sure we get some more questions answered. So thank you all for continuing to join us. This has been an awesome episode. Uh, let us know in the, the comments if you have any questions. Amir, I have a question, you know, back to the, the amount of games you play in a year. Do you, you try to speed run them? Like how do you – you mentioned that you want to get some games to a review point and some games to story completion. So is that – that's the standard you have for all of those 40 to 60 games? Because I can't remember like in the last 12 months – I don't think I've even beat a game in the last 12 months. I was just telling my brother last week, like my schedule, I don't have the discipline for my schedule that you have for yours. So I told him like with my schedule, the only thing I can do, I have a PlayStation. I sign up uh, for the subscription, the monthly subscription, and it allows me to do demos of games. That's all the emotional and physical and mental commitment I can make to a game is to play the demo and then move on to the next demo. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it is, it is very, very, it is very, very regimented. So I, I, I have a notebook and it's behind me or I would have just like put it up to the camera because you'd all get a laugh out of it. But it's, you, you know what it is. I'll give an example that everyone here will relate to, right? Like, you know, games are not formulaic. That's what makes them really great. But like you play enough games, there's like some predictability to what you're going to experience. So like, it's like, okay, <clears throat> I'm playing an action adventure game. I have no idea what to expect. I play the first session and I immediately get a sense of like what's going on. Okay, this is like an Assassin's Creed type game set in Lord of the Rings. Okay, fine. Um, I have a sense of what's going to go on. There's going to be a main story, a main path. There's going to probably be collectibles on top of that. Like, you know, there's this blah, blah, blah. So then I'll split up the game and I'll be like, well, okay, I'm going to do main path and it seems like there's this amount of side quests. So like in my head, I'll try to pay maybe like half of that to get a flavor of that and to see every single <laughs> nice combat ratio to see a little bit of those zones and blend it all together. So I'll be like, okay, uh, each session I play, you know, whatever, let's say I play for two hours. I always sit with a little chess clock. Also, so I'm like, um, uh, or a little um, like test clock. So I like don't go over time. I truly do it. I turn it on and off. And so I'll be wow. like, well, okay. Given this genre, I think I need 20 hours, okay? Sometimes I'll, I'll hit that. Before that, I'll be like, I'll be that or get there faster. I'll get there slower. And so I'll be like, okay, <clears throat> I estimate that I need 10 sessions to cover this game. I'll have my little notebook. I'll write myself a few little notes as I go through the game. And yeah, that's basically the approach. And so I do that for the games. Like, But I will say this, right, as, you, as, as everyone uh, watching this knows, um, the amount of time really varies a lot by game. It is true that lately a lot of the kind of like action adventure, like Zelda type games, Witcher type games, sure, those take like a long time. And a lot of those, I have to kind of go pretty fast through the main story and play enough of the side quest to see that they have depth with the interesting blah, blah, blah. But a lot of other games and genres like puzzles and even like Dave the Diver, right? Those are much, much shorter games. And since I would say that in particular, another reason I started the Amir Awards is I love the Game Awards, really do. And I've only met Jeff Keighley once briefly, but he was a really, really nice guy. I think he does an amazing job, and it's like a real, real credit to our industry. It's pretty remarkable, right? But I think that for a variety of reasons, and I think the numbers back that up, the Game Awards gets more attention on larger games, on AAA titles. And so my little thing, which, you know, only probably like, you know, 5,000 people watch, but I don't care because I get it for my own amusement. Um, I really try to play everything. So I really try to put an emphasis on playing indie games that people don't even hear of and probably don't get attention. Those tend to be shorter. So that's another part of why I can play so many. If I was playing only Starfield-like games, I probably wouldn't be able to play more than 10 or 15 a year. So um, talk about indie games. What is your advice to indie game developers, uh, indie gamers, indie, indie game people that's trying to scale and grow? What's some advice to kind of help, help them scale to be, I mean, not triple A, but just kind of scale to be above indie? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to get over my skis because I'm obviously not a game designer or a game developer or anything like that. So I say it as a BD person, as an enthusiast who's played a lot of games and has talked to a lot of people who have made a lot of great games. I think that the, the number one thing I can say that people tell me is similar to what I've said. I think... <laughs> I think you make better games by being a better informed person about games and other media, whether that's playing a lot of games, just reading a lot, 
seeing a lot of art, of movies, of music, of stuff like that. So I think just exposing yourself to a wide variety of media is very helpful. I would say the other thing is that you, I would say don't start a games project unless you have a conviction behind a small nugget of an idea that you really believe in, that you believe is differentiated enough. Now, again, this shows how poor of a commercial mind I have because lots of games can be very samey. It can do very well. But I think the games that do the best and that de-risk themselves have that concept really well fleshed out and have something that's pretty interesting. And I think don't be afraid of doing something that's really different. I would say that when I think about... um, over the last two or three years, the like 10 or 15 games that I played that were indie games that were the best, they were just really out there. And I think too many people, and I can even say this with my BD hat of what goes on at Tencent, I think too many people shut themselves down from going after bold ideas like that because they think it's too far out of left field. I think about like I was a teenage exo a teenage exo colonist for anyone who played that, which blended like adventure ideas with literally drawing cards and role playing. It was like really out there. Or I think about like strange horticulture, which blended like an adventure concept with like gathering plants and like, you know, kind of like a paper please feel. So like, I feel like those are the games that stick out with me rather than the like 15th or 20th, like whatever game, even though many of those also are very, very good too. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So we're we're running up on time here. I want to be respectful for your time. I wanted to make sure if anyone has any last questions uh, for Mario or for Amir that you get those asked so that we can make sure that they get answered. Um, as as we, we wait for those last few questions to come in, um, Amir, do you have any parting thoughts about um, kind of the future of the games industry, kind of growth opportunities? I know we've, we've seen it, it uh, we'll say, correct from the boom we've seen over the last two or three years. Um, where do you see opportunities for growth? You know, it's it's very, very hard to say. I mean, I'll, I'll build up to my answer, which is... Um, There's no question that a significant amount of consolidation is going on, whether that's in just very traditional inorganic acquisition, whether that's in the power that kind of uh, traditional media players have, right? Whether that's roll up of services like, you know, Game Pass or Netflix or PlayStation. So I think that growth opportunities, I think, depend upon what seat you're sitting in. If you're sitting in the perspective of, oh, I want to start a studio or I want to make um, indie games, I would say that an interesting thing to ask yourself has to be not just like, what game do I make? But if you're being a shrewd business person, how does the work that I'm doing fit into one of these subscription services? Because if you're someone who's not making a AAA game, you either have to get very lucky and land a very big hit. Or even though that money, uh, subscription programs is not nearly what it used to be at Epic and Microsoft and so forth, not me saying it is publicly documented information, I think that still they're going to hold a lot of power to make kingmakers of those titles. So I think understanding what they're looking for, what those are, building relationships to those companies, that's your growth if you're a smaller player. If you're a bigger player, it seems very clear that the industry is moving away from traditional box products to game as a service products. And also there's a very big emphasis on cross media and what things can be turned into shows and what things can be turned into movies and things like that. Now, of course, that's easier said than done. There's only been a small number of companies that have actually shown that they can do games as a service successfully. But I clearly think those are areas people are focusing on. My counterpoint to that would be to the industry, as I always say, don't get over fixated on that and think that gas is like, you know, and live services is your open-ended path to like a lot more money. If you look at uh, the last two years of the products and mobile is a whole different animal. So I'm talking a little bit more about um, uh, PC console here. The products that have really done well have been traditional box product games for the most part that just really knocked it out of the park. So I don't think there's a singular answer, but I think that you can find opportunity in all of these individual areas. Excellent, excellent answer. Awesome. And we have one more question from Mike, which says, uh, and my question is, how do you feel about the industry at large switching to GAAS, Games as a Service, as impacted the quality of games released currently? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think that it really depends upon, 
uh, gas is a very uneven thing, right? I think that games that start backwards, games have to be paid for somehow, right? No one's going to pay it. Yeah. It's not going to pay for itself. You either have to pay for a box product or you have to back into what gas is. I think that in instances where that's been done the best, I, I think, and again, reason people will disagree, but if you think about something like, you know, Destiny, if you think about something like Warframe, I think those are games where they have gas, but because the uh, barrier to entry is reasonable, I think you have a good gas experience that I think can be a lot of fun. I think there's a lot of other products that do this much less well and really grind you on microtransactions, on battle passes, and so forth. You know, this is one where there's going to be a little bit of a difference between gamer Amir with my personal hat on and like my professional hat of having to be mindful of where growth is and stuff like that. I can tell you as a gamer who again is over 40 and grew up with only box products and in particular grew up when he was a child with games like, you know, Sierra online and so forth, where you paid 40 to $50 for like an offline adventure game with no achievements, with yeah. no multiplayer, right. which was like six hours yeah. long and the game was over and I loved it. It's all, I'm going to have trouble as long as I'm on God's green earth, getting away from the fact that like single purchase box products are what I really loved. But I know that different modalities exist for a variety of good reasons. And I think we should be mindful that a good gas game that, for example, is free to play, but is not aggressive and has cosmetic only monetization might mean it's more accessible and more people can enjoy it. I'm also mindful of the fact that we should always remember, uh, I have the luxury of going out anytime I want and either getting a key or paying $60 for a game. A lot of people don't have that luxury or may not have as much money. And so I think with appropriate controls on microtransactions, that can mean a lot more people get to play good and interesting content. I mean, it's interesting. So that, that kind of got me back to um, me playing James Bond. So, you know, James Bond was a console. I love that game. But to your point, it was just me and four other people, three other people playing. But I like, just imagine if it was like, like it is now, right? If I had people all across the world playing, it just you know. But you gotta, you gotta, you gotta pay for it. So I definitely see both sides. From a business standpoint, though, revenue and scaling uh, games as a service, uh, not a bad business model. But I, I de 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 definitely <laughs> not. But we have to make sure that it works, you know. And many gas games yeah. have not made it, you know, and I'm not made money versus the box product. So I think with all of these yeah. things we're raising. No one size fits all. I think I think the healthiest attitude, even though it's less exciting because people like bold pronouncements, is to say that, you know, these are all tools and you should ask yourself which model best fits your game rather than everything's going to be gas now. Like, I certainly see that as an attitude in some corners of the industry, too, and I don't think that's good either. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much for your time today. Uh, excellent conversation. We appreciate all the insights. Before you leave, uh, again, two more housekeeping items. Can you let everybody know where they can find you, follow you, and support you? And then also, if you don't mind picking a winner uh, from our most engaged or, or best questions. I know we had several of them, so maybe that that's a bit more of a challenge than trying to, to finish 60 games in a year. But if you want to pick someone, uh, we, we'd like to um, thank them for their, their support and their engagement and award them a digital copy of Mario's book and my book. Sure. So uh, in, in order, uh, I guess for engagement, there's been a lot of good comments, but I, I do see, um, I do see Mitchell's name popping up a lot and he's been putting a lot of nice comments. So uh, no disrespect to anyone else, just the first name that popped into my mind. So I'll go with you, Mitchell. And then for, um, for, uh, where to find my stuff. So uh, uh, as mentioned for my LinkedIn profile, everybody, it's, you know, linkedin.com backslash I N backslash my name, all one word, Amir Satvat. And then YouTube is youtube.com backslash C backslash my name, all one word, Amir Satvat. Awesome. Thanks for that. And then Mario, where can everybody find, follow you and support you? Yep, yep, yep. So uh, just Google Mario Payne, right? Or you do uh, the Relax Investor, relaxinvestor.com, or uh, my Instagram uh, and also my YouTube. Pay for profits, P A Y N E F U L, profits, because we make money. It can be painful, but there's still profits, though. So let to hear from you guys and see how I can help. Appreciate that. And thank you all again for joining us for an excellent episode. Um, again, if you look down here at the link at the scrolling marquee, um, go bit.ly slash stoned underscore esports. You can get 20% uh, off and free shipping on the stoned ape um, health supplement.
supplements for mood, energy, and sleep. I'm going to take some dream here because I've been at the computer all day. Uh, again, there are no drugs in it, even though it says stone date, there are no mushrooms or any kind of things that might be tangentially illegal, all, all natural, all legal, uh, but, but great opportunity there. And we, we appreciate your support. We will see you next week. Our next week's episode will be on Wednesday um, at 9 p.m. EST. Sorry, 9 p.m. Yeah, EST, 6 p.m. PST. Thank you again, Amir. Thank you, Mario. Thank you all for joining us. Next week, we'll continue to help you to level up your wealth. We'll see you soon. Boo.